Next, uh, our guest alumni speakers, Dr. Boof Singh. This is a photo you gave, your office gave us, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a completely natural, non, non-posed photo. We just uh, <laughs> a quick uh, cell phone shot. <laughs> Selfie. By definition, he's a product of SUNY Downstate. He received MD from SUNY Downstate in 1991. He completed his otolaryngology residency at SUNY Downstate in 1997 under mentorship of Dr. Lucente. He, co- uh, he joined, um, well, in his residency, he joined Dr. Shaw's head and neck surgical oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He subsequently joined faculty staff at Sloan. And at the same time, he continued his affiliation with SUNY Dallas State. Don't know how to do that. <laughs> he serves as an attending surgeon at Sloan Kettering and professor of otolaryngology at Cornell. He is also director of Epithelial Cancer Biology Lab. Recently, I learned that um, Dr. Singh had joined a uh, lab during his fellowship practically against his will. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he uh, was made an offer that he couldn't refuse. Um, <laughs> None of us, former fellows, current fellows, can say no to Dr. Shah. <laughs> Since then, he distinguished himself as a surgeon scientist by making important discoveries in this field of cancer genetics. He also is a thoughtful clinician uh, who I frequently consult when I'm faced with a difficult case, and a meticulous surgeon who taught me how to teach thyroidectomy. Please welcome Dr. Singh, my teacher and mentor. It's, it's really a privilege to be back. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be invited for the first Frank Lucenti Resident Research Day, and I guess I, I either didn't disappoint or maybe they couldn't get anybody else, so I'm really happy to be back for my second uh, stint. Um, very much, you know, you, you come back to your, your home institution, and very much like your whole life you're trying to impress your parents, you're always trying to impress your mentors, and I, I could say that that's absolutely the case here. Um, you know, I got my start in orlangology through two people in this room. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Lucenti, of course. Um, he had a way of inspiring you, and those of you know, and as I just experienced, make you shift a little uneasily in your chair whenever you felt like it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it, watching what he did and how he does it and how he leads uh, was really inspirational. Um, the person who actually drove me into the field is, was a resident, uh, Gadi Harrell. Didn't say much when he said things. He, I felt like he was mumbling because um, I never heard half of the time what he was saying. Um, but I found myself intently listening because whenever he said something, there was going to be a pearl in there. And you know, I still have notes that I took uh, from the things that he taught me years ago. And of course, Dr. Rosenfeld, um, talking about shifting uneasily in your chair. I, I still remember the day that uh, I sat with him for an hour. I think he called me an idiot about six times in that one hour. <laughs> uh, but I walked out with <laughs> I walked out with an unbelievable understanding. At least I felt like I, I knew what statistics was about in, in that one hour. And it was really motivational because it, it, it sort of changed my perspective on research and how to do it and um, uh, how to apply things um, that I was learning to, to improve the care that I was giving. So uh, it's really a privilege to be back here. And I think uh, you, the residents, uh, once you get out of here and you understand what you took away from here, um, I don't think you'll ever have an educational experience at that same level ever again. So thank you for the invitation. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit of philosophy. As, uh, you know, Dr. Saki's talk was outstanding. It's hard to follow that with a data-driven talk. So uh, rather than try and, and even come close, I'll just talk a little philosophically. And so you know, the, the real problem for cancer treatment is that we damage our patients. Um, we either burn them with radiation, we scar them with surgery, or we poison them with chemotherapy with the hopes that the damage is more to the cancer side than it is to the patient side. And, you know, I, I can't, uh, any, anybody Trekkie here? Any, any Trekkies here? Yeah? Mm-hmm. You know, the older people. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so I grew up watching Star Trek, and I was always struck by this one episode where, um, the Star Trek team went back in time and they showed up in a hospital 
and Bones, the, the, the doctor, walks around the hallway and he sees a, uh, this woman actually, I couldn't get this video, I would love to get this video, um, sitting in the hallway and, and asks her, good God, what's the matter with you? And, um, and she said, well, my kidneys have failed, I need dialysis. He said, dialysis? What is this, the dark ages? He goes, take two of these pills. And later on in the scene, it comes back around and the woman says, doctor gave me pills and I grew a new kidney. I grew a new kidney. You know, I think that's the ideal of what we are trying to achieve. Um, we're really trying to achieve an endpoint of getting rid of broken cells without harming the normal cells and doing it in a way that doesn't leave scars uh, and doesn't leave damage to the patient. And of course, the interns will never believe it. Really, a new kidney um, and fully functional. Um, so that little question at the end remains important because if you don't question, you don't achieve. Um, and I think that's a, a lesson that you'll take away with you. So are we still in the dark ages? I don't think there's any doubt. Uh, if you've seen some of the patients that we treat and the sequelae that they suffer, um, it, it, 10 years from now, um, less, less likely, but 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, we will be calling this barbaric therapy. We will, you know, the, the newer physicians will look at us like, how could you be in doing this? Um, and so why is that going to happen? Well, we really need to move forward from traditional thinking. And traditional thinking is take what you have and make it better. Um, and so the robotic surgery, it's the big wave in head and neck cancer treatment. It's going to improve everything. Uh, and so maybe it does decrease the morbidity a bit, but it certainly has not proven itself oncologically better in any way to the patients that we treat. And we do that to radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And very similarly, while proton beam therapy, which is the equivalent of robotic surgery in the cancer world, has really um, gelled the interests of a lot of uh, physicians and, and cancer practitioners, it really has not proven beneficial. And in fact, uh, it may actually prove more harmful um, as we start to accumulate long-term data on these patients. Well, what's the Star Trek model? The Star Trek model, I think I first experienced it as part of a, a team that was looking at lung cancer. Um, so this was an a, a, a x-ray of a woman with um, bronchialveolar carcinoma. Um, she basically has pneumonic disease. Uh, this woman was sent home uh, on hospice care. She was oxygen dependent. She could not get up and walk more than a step or two. And essentially the thought was she may survive for no more than a month. Uh, why don't we try her on this new medication and see if it works. This is the same x-ray about a month later. Um, so this was sort of the, the aha moment. Uh, the, wow, look what we just did. We just took this woman and you know, a week after starting the medication, she called us up and said, look, we're, I'm off the oxygen. I just walked to the grocery store five blocks away. I'm cooking dinner. I feel great. I don't know what you gave me, but this is it. And what this was, was a EGFR inhibitor. And, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of that, uh, one of the original groups that ended up identifying these mutations. And now it's almost a standard part of lung cancer therapy to screen for these mutations and then drive treatment based on the presence of these mutations. Because it turns out that if you have the mutation, and these are waterfall plots, this is shrinkage and tumor over time, depending on what mutations you have. Um, and these are EGFR inhibitors. Uh, Naira Rizvi is one of our medical oncologists uh, who uh, ran this trial. But it turned out if you have this mutation in the EGFR gene, or even in genes that work through the same pathway, you can get that same aha moment in a lot of patients. So that Star Trek model really is to try and recapitulate what we saw in this patient and translate it to other patients. And how do we do that? Well, we do that primarily by understanding the biology of cancers. So this patient was a serendipitous discovery. So we gave her a drug, she responded. We went back and we sequenced the tumor and we found this mutation. Um, and it led to a whole lot more work being done to sort of parse that, all that information together. That's the backward way. The forward way is to start with the mutation and work towards the treatment and use that mutation to develop novel therapies and, and use that mutation to sort of pinpoint target 
the tumors that were taken care of. And so a very quick premise or, or a, a background on cancer biology, I think the first thing to realize is from, by the time you can first detect a tumor, about two-thirds of a lifespan of the cancer has already passed. So what we call early cancer, which is in situ or stage one cancer, if you look at it on the oncologic spectrum, it's really advanced disease. And so as we move forward, we may start to think of this way we classify tumors quite differently. And by the time the tumor becomes palpable or leads to the death of the patient, it's really about one-third of the lifespan of that cancer cell. Um, and so there's a lot happening before we can detect these tumors and, and maybe an opportunity to target. And what's happening? So it's a, a panoply of signals coming together and a panoply of influences coming together that drives a cancer cell. In fact, it's very difficult for a cell to become cancerous. Uh, and what, how does it become? Well, there's environmental factors. I, I think one of the best example of environmental factors is gastric cancer in Japan. It's 500 times higher than gastric cancer in the United States. But if you take a, a Japanese person, have them uh, for a few generations in the U.S., they don't have the same risks. Their risks change. So something in the Japanese environment was driving all of those factors. There are carcinogens that we know of the, in, in the environment. There are carcinogens we don't know of. But tobacco and alcohol and now HPV is a very well-established carcinogen. If you're exposed to these, you're more likely to get these tumors. We inherit factors, uh, so uh, genetic predisposition syndrome, BRCA mutation for breast cancer is probably the highlight of, uh, or, or the, the, the best example of an inherited genetic syndrome. Um, sorry, uh, uh, syndromes come last. Inherited factors, factors that we don't know, uh, also play a role in this process. So what do we inherit? And that's the big question. So there's a whole lot of literature saying that head and neck cancer is inherited. Um, but it's conflicting literature. And what it turns out is you don't actually inherit head and neck cancer risk. You, had, you inherit carcinogen susceptibility risk. So if you're from the same parents and they have head and neck cancer and one twin smokes and the other twin doesn't smoke, the twin that smokes is going to have a much higher risk of, of getting head and neck cancer than the general population. The twin that doesn't smoke will not. So what you're inheriting is this genetic susceptibility. And Really, the factors that contribute to this genetic susceptibility is how you process the, the tobacco carcinogen. So you, when you first soak up the carcinogen, either with tobacco or alcohol, you actually get a pre-carcinogen, and your enzymes convert it to make it an active carcinogen, and then another set of enzymes will deactivate it to blocking it from a carcinogen. And so I think it's easy to understand that if you have an overactive enzyme system, or an underactive, underactive detoxification system, you may have a higher cancer risk. Easier said than done to try and make these associations because you literally need hundreds and hundreds of patients, I take that back, thousands and thousands, and years of work to be able to make a direct association. We may not see that in our lifetime, but indirectly we do. Not only are you inheriting damage-related factors, but you also have an ability to repair. Um, and so uh, uh, Eric Sturgis has shown that repair genes, slight changes, not mutations, but polymorphisms, can drive genetic susceptibility. And this balance is what does it. And I, and I think we all see people who say, look, I've smoked you know, three packs a day for 90 years. I've never gotten a cancer. Uh, and then other people who've gotten cancer who've only been exposed to secondhand smoke. And really, the difference between the two is this change in balance of accumulating DNA damage and repairing DNA damage. And the holy grail is to understand exactly how that happens. That may not happen, happen in our lifetime, but a lot of things will come forward. And I, and I point to this as a genetic predisposition syndrome because I think it's probably the best and, and most significant one in head and neck cancer, and that's the Fanconi population. Uh, paper, people with Fanconi anemia have really about a 500 times higher rate of head and neck cancer than people who don't have Fanconi anemia. If they lo live long enough, they would all get head and neck cancer. At least that's what I'm seeing because I see most of these from around the world and around the country. Um, uh, and almost every person who's living to the age of 40, I get to see with a precancer or a cancer at some point in their lifetime. Most of them die of other causes, unfortunately. But as new treatments emerge, uh, I think we're going to learn a lot from them. The other thing that we've learned a lot from is the oropharynx uh, a boon, if you will, 
The increasing risk of oropharynx cancer continues. It's probably the fastest rising cancer in the United States, and that's clearly related to papillomavirus, and you can see, especially in this older study, a change in prevalence of the papillomavirus as we go from the 70s to the 80s and to present time. And probably this reflects changes in sexual behavior with, if you look at a, a survey from the New York City uh, high school graduates, uh, more than 75% have had oral sex by the time they graduate high school. Uh, much fewer actually now have vaginal or, uh, sex. And so oral sex exposure now is firmly linked as a causative factor in oropharynx cancer and it's likely to grow. Now what's really interesting about this is that the cancers look relatively similar whether you come from the tobacco side or you come from the papilloma side. And in fact, the pathways that are affected are identical. So you can affect P53 by directly mutating it or by inactivating it. The E6 protein in papilloma inactivates it. You can affect P16 and RB in a similar way by directly mutating or methylating uh, if you're smoking or inactivating it with an E7 protein. But, it, uh, but even though they look relatively similar in the microscope, even though their pathways are identically affected, albeit with, in a different way, their behavior is dramatically different. Papilloma positive tumors do much better. They, in fact, they do so much better in the next iteration of the AJCC, there's likely to be a change and a separation of oropharynx cancers based on papilloma status, and we probably won't see a stage four papilloma related head and neck cancer unless there's distant metastatic disease at presentation because the response rates are so great that it, it's, it's not the same disease. And, it, and the staging system no longer applies as it did to tobacco-related malignancies. And this is borne out in comparison of, of oropharynx clinical trials uh, over and over again with you know, more than double digits differences in survival rates uh, between papilloma positive and negative tumors that are identically treated. In our institution, we expect a, uh, uh, actually up to a, definitely a three-year, probably a five-year local regional control rate of over 96% with non-surgical therapy, regardless of your stage of presentation with papilloma-related cancer. I can't say that for any other cancer that presents at stage four, but for papilloma-related cancer, certainly. In fact, it's so dramatic that we are actively investigating dose reduction. Uh, we're now actually, one of our protocols is, is really interesting in that we're only giving 30 gray of radiation instead of the traditional 70 gray and getting results that are shocking. Um, tumors melting away and um, uh, even at 30 gray um, within a short period of time. So these are exquisitely sensitive and, and maybe a window into understanding tobacco-related cancers, and so we have an active program studying it. Now, the other thing I want you to take away as you think about these tumors is that it takes a long time for damage to accumulate, and the damage stays with you. So people who, who are smokers, if you put their risk at 100%, if they quit smoking for 10 years or less, they don't go down to a zero risk. In fact, it takes them almost 30 years to get close to the risk of a non-smoker. So the damage is heritable, and by that I mean once it occurs, it gets passed from cell to cell to cell as cells multiply, and they stay with you. And that's why former smokers still have a higher risk of head and neck cancer, but it's also why tobacco cessation should be started early rather than later in the process. I think we owe a debt to Hanahan and Weinberg uh, for defining what factors contribute to carcinogenesis. This is their revised model. The, uh, uh, the original model had very much fewer things, but every single one of these phenomena are contributed to genetic event, contributed to by genetic events that drive each of these phenomena. And there's many genetic events that overlap in what they do. So one event, one genetic change may not just drive uh, cell death or resistant to cell death or, or uh, disengaging um, a metabolism. Uh, it may uh, cross-fertilize, if you will, in terms of its pr uh, uh, pushing cancer growth. So how do we get to the end point here? And, and in the past, I could tell you sitting on a pipette uh, over and over again uh, to look at one gene, it took years. And now what we're doing is where things are really accelerating, which is high throughput analysis. Um, the, the, the different exp gene expression or mutation techniques 
have now become a big part of how we think about cancers. Uh, we actually have now a molecular group at Memorial Sloan Kettering where difficult to treat cancers are sequenced and the sequence information used to um, directly treat our patients. Uh, in fact, we've, in, our, in the head neck subpopulation, when we do this sequencing, 25% of patients actually have targetable mutations and drugs that can target those mutations. And in those patients, the survival difference um, compared to standard chemotherapy is dramatic. Uh, it's 40-50% it's survival difference um, based on targeted therapy uh, in that population. So all of this has sort of allowed this Cancer Genome Project to develop. Um, as some of you may recognize the two gentlemen here, are Hal Varmus. Um, anybody know the one, one on your right? It's, um, well, it's Watson of Watson and Crick. Um, so Harold was the person who had led, led that lung uh, research group that led to the EGFR mutation. And, you know, I had, I mean, I still kind of consider it one of my greatest honors to be involved in a series of phone calls with Harold, uh, with Watson, um, two of the Nobel laureates, three full professors, me as a junior attending, and one fellow from Harold's lab. Um, and a series of about six phone calls later, uh, and three phone calls from Harold to the NIH, and there was a billion dollars being expended to do the TCGA. Uh, so the night is for this TCGA product, uh, project comes from that one single patient that led to the EGFR um, uh, identification. Um, I don't think that we can even begin to, you know, understand exactly what the TCGA has contributed. It's actually defined the undefinable. Uh, it's defined pathways and genes and mutations and individual genes that we are going to be dissecting for years and years to come. And the challenge has shifted. While the challenge when I first started was to try and identify these mutations, um, the challenge now has become what do these mutations mean and how do we exploit these mutations to treat our patients. And you know, there's certainly targetable events, EGFR, uh, we heard about from the last speaker how, how important these are, but many other events all the way down the line, PA3 kinase, um, the, um, um, uh, th these pathways are being actively developed and drugs being actively developed to try and address these patients. Now what I want you to notice though is that there's not a high proportion of any individual mutation. So not every patient will have an individual mutation. And that thought process is really relevant as I go further in my talk because head and neck cancer may be defined by an EGFR mutation or it may be defined by a cyclin D1 amplification and those two patients, although they're the same head and neck cancer, may require completely different treatments. But it also turns out that this head and neck cancer that has an EGFR mutation is much more similar to a lung cancer that has that same EGFR mutation than it is to a histologically identical tumor. And so as we think about how we're going to do this, we're going to have to shift a lot of paradigms on traditional ways of categorizing our patients and maybe even selecting therapy. Uh, I won't go into a lot of the bioinformatics that's going to be driving a lot of this, but the, the next big thing that's needed in cancer um, um, uh, analysis is for bioinformatics to catch up with the data that uh, we already have generated. And I'm not going to go into this too much, but these are a, su a summary of some of the sequencing studies. And you can see that all of them have repeatedly identified the same genes and the same pathways over and over again. This is actually very different than what was supposed to be the original panacea, which was the RNA expression profiles. In fact, if you looked at RNA expression profiles, there was a lot of differences between one study and another study, and it was very difficult to decipher exactly what was going on. Uh, just to highlight some of the pathways that Hanahan and Weinberg have sort of identified as important players, cell death, immunity, differentiation, oxidative stress, all of these pathways are obviously being contributed to by multiple factors and multiple genes uh, within head and neck cancer. Luke Morris, who's one of our uh, newest attendings, has really been a, a great addition to our faculty. He's our genomics person, but he's taking it a step further. He's actually identifying mutations and then doing functional analyses of each of these mutations and with the hope of sort of driving things into the 
clinically relevant realm. So to go from bench to, um, to clinical science. So while all these mutations are out there, there's a ton of treatments that are already out there. Many of them develop randomly, and somehow we can integrate some of these. And, and this is just, and I'm sure you can't read all the slides, but these, this is just a list of cancers and the different targeted agents that are approved by the FDA to treat those cancers. Uh, in the red are some things that may be relevant to head and neck cancers, but it's a minority. It's really not um, um, a significant disease that's being looked at in uh, any meaningful way. And, and part of the problem with head and neck cancers is that they're genetically dense. So this is a, 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 a plot showing the relative genetic density in different types of cancer. And you can kind of see head and neck is sort of at the top of the list. And, and the problem with that genetic density is that cancers are not smart. They're actually kind of stupid. Um, and they accumulate genetic events randomly and continuously with the hopes of getting the right ones. And the ones that are the really stupid cancers tend to be also some of the worst ones because they have thousands and thousands of genetic events which hide the eight or ten really important events. And so the reason head and neck cancers are so difficult to target is because we have difficulty identifying cancer drivers from what are called passenger mutations in these tumor systems. Uh, one pathway that clearly appears to be relevant is the EGFR pathway. Um, this we've shown in, in head and neck cancers um, many years ago. Actually, I missed an opportunity because this, I, I sequenced many of the genes that we were looking at back then when I was doing my postdoc uh, with Arnie Levine, um, except for PI3 kinase, which turns out to be a missed opportunity because it was easy to sequence back then and we didn't do it. Uh, but subsequently, it's obviously been shown to be a very important player by the TCGA project. And it's actually been shown now and approved uh, agents that target EGFR to play a big role. I'm not going to go into much of the data here, but quite honestly, we're not impressed. In fact, at, at Sloan, even though this is a uh, um, FDA-approved drug, we are not actively using it unless we don't have any other options because we're not thinking that it's having a major impact in the patients that we're treating. So even the ones that look interesting, that biologically are relevant, the drugs may not be good enough to do what we need them to do in that population. So there are efforts out there to try and link mutations with uh, genetic events. And uh, two of the most prominent ones are using cancer cell lines and combining them with compounds and trying to link genetic events and sensitivities to the compounds uh, at the molecular level. And it's interesting because out of all of the cell lines that these, these two have tested, there's uh, 471 overlaps and 15 drug overlaps. And while it's, it's exciting to say that there are correlations, we can say that the genetic correlations are excellent. But it turns out that the drug correlations are very poor. So the genetic events that predict response in one study do not predict response in the other study, and the ones that don't predict response in study A do predict response in study B. So it is not as simple as a single genetic event that may be driving all of this, and the correlations may actually require combinations of genetic events, again, the bioinformatics challenge. So why are we having trouble? Well, it turns out tumors are heterogeneous in the genetic composition, and you can kill off one part while the other survives. So what we're likely to see is combination therapies that are generally cytotoxic combined with targeted therapies to get the results we're looking for. The cancer stem cells, which are, tend to be resistant to standard therapies because they're not as proliferative and they can become quiescent. The effects of the microenvironment, the development of resistance, and the currently available clinical trial models are major limiting factors. And uh, I alluded to earlier, that we are going to start to look at clinical trials differently, and this is a perfect sort of representation of that. Rather than thinking of diseases by what their anatomic or histologic depiction is, we're going to start in the future to look at diseases based on their molecular signatures. 
and clinical trials will be run not based on histology or anatomic location, but which molecular signature you fit into. The, the so-called basket trials, where individual genetic events drive inclusion rather than the disease type, are some of the most successful trials that are being done uh, within our institution today. I'm going to change gears a little bit and kind of give you an idea of what I do in the laboratory. Um, so a lot of my research interest was driven at, in clinical research. Um, and as Natalia alluded to, when I got a phone call from Dr. Shah about the fellowship, he said that I'm perfect, quote unquote, I'm perfect for the extra time and research um, part of the fellowship. And I, of course, I said, yes, sir, yes, sir. Like Natalia knows, you never say anything but yes, sir. Um, and I got off the phone and I looked at my wife and I said, this guy's crazy. I mean, I've never done a, a day of lab work in my life. Why would I go into it? And what he understood before I did and wh what I understood when I got into the laboratory is that your impact will be more significant if you go back to the basic science roots than anything you can do pretty much. Um, not, that's, that's not a universal statement, but anything you could pretty much do with clinical sciences. And so I kind of jumped into this wholeheartedly, and by the time I finished my residency, my, uh, my research fellowship, we had a, a genetic event that we thought was interesting, and it turned out that this genetic event was present in a lot of different types of cancers. It was very high frequency in head and neck cancers, as well as other squamous cell cancers, and that's what kind of drove me to investigate it further. And what I thought back then was that there may be an important gene that we can exploit to treat patients. And it turns out that the TCGA subsequently has validated this. There's big differences in outcome in head and neck based on the presence or absence of this gene, but also other tumors where the gene is not as prevalent, there's an independent impact or prediction of survival based on the presence or absence of this gene. And we've, we've kind of delved into trying to understanding how this gene works. And our cell line work told us it works in proliferation. We made a knockout mouse and confirmed its proliferative role. We went to a fly model and further validated that role, um, looking at both overexpression and knockouts in the fly. We were able to sort of show a major uh, impact on proliferative activity based on whether we turn the gene on. And also, uh, as the bottom panel shows you, these are eyes where the gene is turned off. The proliferative activity was completely lost. And yeah, I'm not going to go into the wing models and the, uh, the NOTA that we've investigated to kind of validate our initial findings. Uh, long story short, uh, that has allowed us to figure out a fundamental mechanism of how a key component of mitosis is being regulated called abscission. Our paper actually just got uh, accepted to molecular cell biology um, that sort of defines this mechanism. Uh, we've gone on to show that the gene is important in, as an oncogene by expressing the genes in, in mice and, and having, those, having that expression lead to in vivo cancer formation. Uh, we've gone on to show that there's mutations that are identified by the TCGA and the presence of these mutations uh, supercharge the oncogenic activity of this gene. We've gone on to show that not only is the gene relevant to the cancer cells, but it's also relevant to the microenvironment. And what we did is we took knockout mice and wild-type mice, and we fed them a carcinogen, and it turned out that the number of tumors and the size of tumors never grew to the same level in knockout mice as it did in wild-type mice, so suggesting a resistance phenotype. And as we kind of investigated it further, we realized this was not due to the cancer cell. When we took melanoma cells, lung cancer, or breast cancer cells, and injected them into these mice, they didn't grow. In fact, what ended up happening is this is a melanoma model where we've injected in the flank of one side and in the flank on the other side, and the melanoma has grown through and attached itself all the way across through the abdomen of this mouse, whereas in the knockout mouse, it barely grew. And when we looked at these tumors, they were severely necrotic um, and rarely, if ever, metastasized or invaded beyond that local milieu. And I'm not going to show you the data, but we were able to do bone marrow transplants into these mice and show that that is driven by the loss of this protein, not in the cancer cell, but in a critical bone marrow cell, which sets up a possibility of targeting the microenvironment. Uh, we've gone on to show the biochemical function of this gene. 
uh, which I'm not going to get into the details of, but basically it's a regulator of nedulation. And by knowing that it's a regulator of nedulation and what this nedulation does in the cancer cell and the microenvironment and how it does it, it set us up to do what we really wanted to do, which is develop new ways to target human cancer. And um, you, sometimes failure drives success. I put in a grant, which unfortunately was not funded, and one of the reviewers was a, a super talented uh, researcher, Brenda Shulman at St. Jude's, who uh, called me very upset that my grant was not funded, flew up from St. Jude's, and we had a three-day meeting with her colleague, Kipling Guy, and we formed a, um, a collaboration at the end of that meeting that led to this, which was an initial screen of 750,000 compounds, which led us to identify um, 493 that were potentially blocking the activity of our gene. Uh, we were able to show through a bunch of um, cellular models and biochemical models how and what it was doing to block the activity. Uh, and by crystal structure analysis, we were able to show that the gene was, uh, the drugs that were actually binding to the protein were the ones that were working. And in fact, we used this biochemical, the structure model to develop a whole series of new compounds. So we've done uh, uh, structure and resequencing about eight rounds, and each round we've uh, resynthesized about 100,000 new compounds with different additions and different extensions. Um, and then be we've been able to prove that the newest compounds, which are really much more potent than the original compound, specifically inhibit the proteins that we're interested in. And this is a, a, a basically a representation of about a thousand different experiments to show that they did not have the off-target effects. Their effects were specific to our protein. So we now had a, a, something that was working specifically in our protein. We went on to show that it has the biochemical inhibition that we were hoping for, not only at the direct biochemical level, but at the downstream target level. So we know that this compound is working very well. I won't show you the data, but it turns out that the compound is really potent in mice. Um, and it's doing all the things that we want it to do. And so what we've really accomplished is develop the compound that we may be able to bring to clinical trial. Uh, our pat we just put in our patents. Our paper has been submitted to Nature. We're waiting to see if they're going to accept it or not. Um, but um, we think that we have a winner. Um, we think we have something that's actually going to have an impact. And so it's really been a very exciting 12 years, starting from actually identifying a genetic event leading to cloning the gene. In fact, this gene did not exist in the genome uh, when we first cloned it. We cloned it from a, uh, a sequencing effort that we did in the laboratory. If the original name of the gene is SCRO. The, my lab guys had named it. Uh, the unofficial, the official acronym is squamous cell carcinoma related oncogene. The reason that they named it SCRO, it was supposed to represent Singh's cancer related oncogene, but the genome wouldn't accept it, so we kept it as squamous cell carcinoma related oncogene. But what we've done is we've gone from a, initial identification of this single genetic event to understanding the biochemical function to understanding its oncologic activity, to understanding its cellular function, to doing a drug screen, to developing a compound, and hopefully in the next two years to do the clinical trial. The one thing I've asked for is I want to be the person who administers the drug to the first patient that goes on the clinical trial, and that, that will be truly a, a dream come true, um, uh, and hopefully uh, something that we'll be using a lot in our patient population. Of interest is the fact that our knockout mice actually are male-specific and fertile, and we've gotten a lot of interest once we filed a patent from drug companies, not because they're interested in the cancer phenotype, but because they think that this could be a male contraceptive, which obviously is financially is much more interesting to them than their, their oncologic aspect. Um, but it's really been an exciting journey, and I couldn't imagine having come to this journey or even started the journey without the support that you know, I received spe specifically from, from Dr. Lucenti. He gave me an opportunity, um, and I tried to make the best of it, sometimes not exactly the way you may have envisioned, um, but hopefully um, you know, uh, something that he looks at and feels like he did the right thing many years ago. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go 
boldly where no man or woman has ever gone before. I think in the next 10 years, our understanding of cancer biology is going to be dramatically different. In the next 20 years, we're going to start to see the big changes in treatment. And the next 30 years, we're going to start talking about something else. Um, and I, it, it, it's in our lifetime that hopefully we will see this. And, and there's a lot of excitement. It's exactly the right time to be in cancer medicine. And for those residents who are interested, it, it, it's hard work. But if it works, you'll, there's nothing in life other than maybe the birth of your kids that will ever match the feelings that you're going to have and the sense of accomplishment that you'll achieve. With that, I, I want to thank everyone, and especially Natalia. Uh, I'm sorry, Natalia, I, I have to say a word about Natalia. You know, she comes into the OR. And I had to get out of the way. I thought I was going to get bowled over. Uh, yeah, and then, then you kind of talk to her. And then you realize that there's a reason why she is the way she is. Incredibly gifted, incredibly thoughtful, incredibly talented, and you know, always inquisitive. Um, I had to go prepare for my cases with Natalia because I know the hard questions were coming. Um, so it's really great to see her come back to a place that I think is exceptional. And I think the residents will probably benefit a lot from her being here. And thank you so much for the invitation. Um, never. Uh, I think what's going to happen is cancer will become a chronic disease, very much like high blood pressure and diabetes, and we'll probably be able to find things that keep things in check. Uh, it, it's it's a that that hurt, that next hurdle of permanently preventing it is is not likely to be achieved in our lifetime. Um, but we will see a change. I mean, we're going to start thinking of it as a, chronic, as a lot of these chronic diseases. Yeah. Uh, congratulations for excellent work. Thank you. Uh, inspire us, all of us, to continue. I have a question. The first question is, have you uh, do sequencing analysis uh, regarding pre-malignant lesions? Well, yeah, that's a great question. No, we have not. We haven't focused on that. Our biggest hits have come from the odd responders. So a big focus of, of what we're doing and how we're doing it is to pick out the ones that have a unique response or unique resistance for that matter and sequence them because I think, you know, if you really want to understand premalignant lesions, you're going to have to sequence thousands. Uh, and the resources are better spent where you're more likely to get a big hit, which is these unique responders. The second question is, uh, any correlations between the environmental factors? Of course, they, they were smokers, and they should be negative, if I understand correct. The patients who choose to do the sequencing, the very first experiment, we did the sequencing analysis. So any other factors since you realize that there are different mutations? OK? Um, any, any correlations regarding With oh, the environmental factors? Yes. So um, we haven't really looked. Now, if Dr. Dr. Roosevelt, correct me if I'm wrong, you need 15 observations for every event that you want to put into a Cox proportional hazard model. And then if we're going to have multiple testing, we have to correct for that by Bonferroni's correction, if, if I remember correctly from, from your teachings. Um, you don't it, remember. It's not 15 observations. It's 10 events. Oh, whatever. <laughs> 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 of the events you're interested in for every variable. No, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, that hour didn't go so well. We <laughs> I, I think you just called me an idiot again. <laughs> so I, I think the problem is that there's so many um, patients that are required uh, to achieve, achieve a, any statistical significance that, that it's a multi, multi-million dollar effort to try and decipher all these other factors. So no, we haven't looked. I mean, we haven't even tried. We've started with a specific question and designed a study to try and address that question. 
uh, rather than uh, these these sort of post hoc analysis. They get that right post hoc. That was very good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. I have a question about yep. the basket study. Yep. It's very exciting. So, um, do you have any encouraging results in head and neck um, cases? Yeah. So. Um, Yes, and limited. So we haven't done a whole lot of head and neck basket sequencing, but 25% of patients have had targetable events on the ones that we've sequenced. And those patients that have been treated with the targetable uh, drugs that target those events have had a much better survival compared to standard therapy. Um, I don't think we've had a complete response yet, but we've had uh, a lot of partial responses and definitely a significant progression in disease, disease uh, progression-free survival. Uh, so yes, uh, prelim the preliminary data looks really interesting. In the cancers that you call stupid, the genetically dense ones, the mutations that accumulate, are they more or less random or they are? They are. So there's not yeah, so, so, I mean, there, there's definitely selection for mutations. So th there's two lines of thought in how mutations can be present in a cancer. One is that they specifically occur, right? And the other line of thought is that they randomly occur, but because they provide a survival, survival advantage, they're maintained. It's more likely that the, the, the second hypothesis is true. You're getting random events, but if, the, if, the, if an event gives you a survival advantage, you're more likely to, to live into the next daughter cell, right? And so yeah, the stupid mutations lead to smart selection, or Mendelian selection is probably a better way to describe it. Uh, and then so what you see at the end are equivalent of hotspots, which are randomly selected. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I must say when you, uh, very self-serving talk, when, a comment from me, when you give a talk like this, it makes me feel absolutely great, because so, I know that the decision that was made back in 1990 was correct, and uh, you have made us all very proud. Thank, Thank you. you. It means a lot, Dr. Santi. Thank you very much. See, the hard yeah, one. So. Wait, let me just take my jacket off and... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that... Uh, <laughs> that Boo could do this stuff. Uh, we actually forgot we invited you for the first one. That's why you're back again. <laughs> uh, you, were, you were apparently less impressive uh, seven or eight years ago. But it's good to have you back. And good to know. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Roosevelt. <laughs> echo Dr. Lucente's um, uh, comments about how impressive it's been. And I think uh, uh, as you develop a research uh, track, whether it's clinical or basic, you want to have a direction, and everything you do should somehow build on what you've done before. You don't always plan it that way, um, but hopefully somewhere after the initial chaos, if you stick with it, you find yourself you know, building upon the previous thing, and then you get to the exciting point on that last slide you showed where now you've gone from lab work to potentially a trial, and as you said, being the person to inject it into the the patient, so I think that's that's very exciting, and, and it's really a model, I think, of how to do it. I'll take point to you on one thing. Uh oh. Uh, your comment, I think, that sort of basic science was the way to really make a difference, as opposed to clinical um, research. You know that one wouldn't slip by. Right, <laughs> so I, that's I, the one I wrote down. There. You wrote that one. Yeah. 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 I, I, th I think the words that I used was to make a bigger impact. Bigger impact. Yeah. Okay, so how do we measure impact of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, 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 of an article or of a publication? We look at the, uh, uh, well, we look at, we can look at sites, we can look at H indices, right? And uh, I think in general, the H indices in basic science are much higher than uh, in clinical research. In otolaryngology, the average H index for a full professor is about 17 or 18, uh, which is fairly low. Uh, but for articles themselves, uh, I could tell you things like systematic reviews uh, often change practice. I have systematic reviews I've been involved on that over, have over 500 citations now, which is not too shabby. And then I thought they were good until I got involved with guidelines. And the sinusitis guideline is now going on about 920 citations. So 
Uh, I think you can, you can make a difference by publishing things that people find interesting and useful. And I, I think yep. that can be basic science, it could be clinical work, it could be synthetic research like reviews or guidelines or anything. But in general, I agree with you that um, an important, uh, the highest citations, the highest age indices go to the right. basic science. Well, I, I, mean, I, I didn't mean to minimize the it's, uh, significance of clinical research. Um, yeah, I think there's one thing to look at the statistics and the H factors and, and all the other numbers, and it's another thing to look at a patient who should have died but didn't. Um, and, you know, I, I can't think of what I'm going to do that's going to have that impact uh, at the same level with a clinical project as I'm going to be able to do what I'm doing in the laboratory. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of i am looking past the numbers a little bit and looking at that patient who's sitting in front of me kind of thinking, how the hell did I fail in this one? And, you know, maybe I should have been doing something else, pediatric ENT or something like that. <laughs> but, I think you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> but, um, but I think the bottom line for me was, I, 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 I guess I, I was dreaming. I'm still dreaming uh, because I want to have a big, I, I, want to, I want to make a difference. I want to have an impact. Um, and I, I have to say, I read your guidelines and I read your papers and actually I still give lectures and I use your seven habits of highly effective data users over and over again. Uh, you can't minimize the significance of any of that. That's absolutely essential. And that conceptualizes what we know and how we do things and optimizes them to a level. But what I'm looking for is to go beyond that. And, and for me, and, and it, it's different for different people, that comes from the lab. So I, I, I didn't mean to at all negate the uh, importance of clinical research. It must be done, it, and, and I did it, and I enjoyed doing it, and still enjoy doing it. But what, what I was trying to come to was that, that inductive leap um, uh, issues. All right, maybe we will invite you back a third time. We'll have to think about it enough.